Imagine if you will, in the late 1980s, a company being the sixth most powerful naval force on the globe. It sounds ridiculous, but in a technicality it happened. The Pepsi company was traded by the Soviet Union an assortment of submarines, cruisers and destroyers in order for the right to import the sugary beverage into the Soviet Union. How much of that was to do with money and how much of that was to do with stagnation, well, that's, a, that's another conversation to have. But the idea of a company owning an immensely powerful navy is absurd to most people, but it isn't unheard of. Imagine if you will, on the contrary, Amazon having an armed PMC. It's a pretty weird thought, but for a lot of history this was commonplace. The English, then later the British, the Dutch, and to an extent other countries as well did the same thing. And in Britain, that company was known as the East India Trading Company, and it held for much of its existence one of the most powerful fleets on the globe, and it ruled an entire subcontinent with the armies to match. And it began all over some tea and some spices. The East India Trading Company has its origins in the Spanish Armada. Before the United Kingdom was formed, the Kingdom of England, ruled by Queen Elizabeth I, fought perhaps one of the most famous engagements in naval history. The defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588 began the meteoric rise of what would become known as the Royal Navy. Keep in mind, at this point, Spain had been completely ascendant for many, many years, ever since the Reconquista and Isabel and Fernando, the Spanish Empire and the Castilian Empire, supported by everyone else, there's some controversy in Spain to that, really was the most powerful military force. And the defeat of the Armada and the capture of the Spanish and Portuguese ships and cargoes gave English captains the opportunity to travel the globe, really, in search of wealth and riches. Captains who, you know, like Drake and Hawkins, who wanted to make some money, decided to sell and raid the Spanish Americas. As privateers, mind you, because, you know, you can't get in trouble and start a war if you're not actually sanctioned by your government. Yeah, we've heard that one recently, haven't we? But the idea was that by sailing west and east as well, these captains would be able to break the Spanish and Portuguese monopoly on trade. But it should be noted at this point in history, due to familial ties and succession, Portugal and Spain were effectively one entity. They were in a political union, the Iberian Union, which would effectively at this time make them the world superpower. And they had a monopoly on trade to the Far East, don't get that wrong. They completely did, circumnavigating the Ottomans, who really were now on their way out because of this breaking of their monopoly. There would be some back and forward combat between the Ottomans, of course, and you know they would, they would do some shenanigans up until the 1600s, but... When Columbus sailed west, and when Magellan went around the world, and when Drake followed them, it really started to end the Ottoman Empire. Now, on the 10th of April, 1591, Queen Elizabeth I gave her royal blessing to sail east and break this monopoly held by the Spanish and the Portuguese. Sir James Lancaster, sailing at the helm of the Bonaventure, and two accompanying ships sailed from Tor Bay. They sailed around the Horn and into the Arabian Sea and to the Malay Peninsula. And these ships preyed on enemy ships on a voyage of raiding commerce before finally returning to England in 1594. This was one of the first English expeditions to the Far East, but it would not be the last. In fact, the successful expedition opened the floodgates for what would become in short order the jewel in the English crown. The great successes of these voyages though, and the success that truly galvanised the English people and aristocracy and the notion of going east and staying east, was the capture of the Portuguese carrack Madre de Deus by Sir Walter Raleigh and the Earl of Cumberland, which was the largest ship to ever make port in England at the time, and the sight of her, along with the holds of riches, captivated the English people, who got very excited about the fact they could now get very, very rich. The ship also contained some vital intelligence on trade routes to China, India and Japan, which are pretty closely kept secrets at this point. Three more English ships would sail east in 1596, but were unfortunately lost at sea. There's a lot of that at this point in history. But they were followed the following year by Ralph Fitch, an explorer and adventurer who arrived with his companions after an odyssey lasting 15 years. Yeah, 15 years overland through Iraq, Mesopotamia, the Persian Gulf, the Indian Ocean, and the Southeast Asia. It, it, it sounds really heroic, but from what I gathered, it was a bit of a lad's holiday. Fitch gave valuable information and this inspired the English people to form a sort of consortium, a company if you will, in the east, towards India, to capitalise on these riches. So on the 22nd of September 1599, a group of influential merchants met in London to reveal their intention to travel east, with the ultimate goal being of creating a trade network back in Europe 
to England specifically in regard to spice and tea trades. This is where the English, shall we say, obsession begins with tea. Obsession's a bit of a weak word for it. We'll say reliance. They are kind of, they're a bit addicted to it. Together, the merchants committed an incredible sum of money and purchased ships for their project. They then resolved to seek some royal support from the Queen. Although failing in their first attempt, they would receive the monarch's unofficial approval. Unofficial being that she still has a get-out-of-jail-free card if she manages to piss off half of the continent. A year later, on the 31st of September, the merchants would convene again and at last be granted a royal charter. The charter was granted to George, Earl of Cumberland, and 215 of his colleagues, under the name Governor and Company of Merchants of London Trading with the East Indies. Kind of title would fit in the Soviet Union, it's that long, wow. According to the charter, for 15 years the company would have a monopoly on all English trade, with countries east of the Cape of Good Hope, and west of the Straits of Magellan, so east of South Africa, west of South America, everything in the middle bit. Any trader or merchant that breached this charter would have their ships and cargo seized, with half of the profits being given to the crown and the other half to the company. The offending merchant in question would then be imprisoned. The company itself would be in the hands of a governor with 24 individual directors or committees. This made up the court of directors, who in turn reported to the court of proprietors, who were responsible for appointing them. Ten committees reported to the council of directors, and according to tradition, all business was at first transacted at Bishopsgate at Nags Head Inn before the move to India House. So they got a little, they got a little party together. Something you're going to notice as well, uh, because I'm probably going to do more videos on this period. The English have really cool ship names. Just we'll, we'll get into it. So James Lancaster would command the first East India Company voyage in 1601 aboard the 38 gun Red Dragon. It's obviously named after the Welsh dragon, but it's a cool name. Lancaster would capture a Portuguese carrack in the Malacca Straits, the cargo of which allowed him to set up two factories in Java and another in the Malaccas before returning to England. When I say factories, they literally made tea and spice factories, because yeah. Arriving home in 1603, the crew discovered that Queen Elizabeth I had died. Lancaster, however, was knighted by the new King James I, who was also King James in Scotland as well. This is really important. This is when England and Scotland start getting together. With the war against Spain and Portugal ending, it seemed though as if prospects for the new company would be hindered. Now keep in mind, effectively English sea power is not so much a royal navy. Well, now it's British sea power. It's not so much the royal navy. It's, it's more so a group of particularly vicious pirates who have nominal support from the crown, but not entire support from the crown. It's a bit complicated. Instead of ships being, for example, called HMS, they'd be called Ship Royal. So technically you could have situations where Drake's flagship is a privately owned ship, but it's chartered to the Navy who has control of it during the Armada. It's a whole thing, but Drac has a great video on that where he goes over and explains, you know, how ship classification in the line of battle is formed over many years. I watched it the other day. It's fantastic. The forays into the East had effectively broken the Spanish and Portuguese trade monopoly, though. They had achieved their goal. And Sir Henry Middleton would command a second voyage in 1604, and General William Keeling would captain a third from 1607 to 1610. By 1610, there were multiple voyages taking place at the same time, and the amount of ships owned by the company was growing and growing. These voyages were not all positive, as the company would suffer the loss of many men and ships. Leaving in 1607, the ship's ascension and union would be lost at sea, with basically no evidence as to what happened to them. Again, that's not exactly uncommon for this period for things to just, you know, disappear. That's why we get a lot of ghost ship stories. Now, in the beginning, the company struggled very heavily in the European market due to competition from not only the Spanish and Portuguese, but also the well-established Dutch East India Company, which was based in Java, modern-day Indonesia, and the surrounding islands that they had taken up residence in. The original factory that was opened during the first voyage in Bantam was a vital cog in the company's operations for 20 years as it grew, but it would be closed in 1683. During this expansion, ships would begin to arrive in India, and this would really begin Britain's relationship with India, and they started to dock in Surat. Surat was established as a transit trading point in 1608 and would really be the first steps England would take in India. Keep in mind, although England and Scotland were effectively together at this point, it was a personal union, we're not seeing the United Kingdom just yet. The East India Company is a very much an English affair at this point. Two years after the establishment of the transit point in Surat, the company would set up its first factory in southern India in the town of that on the Coromandel Coast in the Bay of Bengal. 
The high profits recorded by the company's factory output in India backfired, and King James I granted subsidiary licenses to other trading companies in England. Simple fact was, there was so much pie, but the company wasn't big enough to eat the whole thing, and other companies wanted a chance at the pie. However, though, in 1609, the king backflipped on this position and renewed the charter, recreating the monopoly of the East India Company for an indefinite period. The new charter did have a catch, though. The charter would cease to be in effect if the trade turned unprofitable for a period of three consecutive years. Unfortunately, this would lead to the kind of situation where profit margins meant more than really anything else. The trading company using its patronage system from a slew of monarchs, both their own in England, later Britain, and in India itself, keep in mind British success in India is really down to how the company was able to manipulate and use local rulers to assist it in its goals. It wasn't an outright conquest, there was no way England was going to outrightly conquer India. Particularly a private company of that, it relied a lot on local support. Using this strategy, it grew at a really rapid rate, and in no time at all, the company found itself in direct competition with the Portuguese Estado da India, Portuguese East India Company, or Portuguese India Company, in regard to lucrative trade routes and outposts in Persia and along the Indian subcontinent. In 1622, the castle of Ormuz, which had been under the control of the Portuguese since its establishment by Alfonso de Albuquerque in 1507, attracted the ire of the East India Company. The company knew that attacking the fort even if they themselves did not control it, would lead to a break in the already fragile hold the Portuguese held over trade in the Far East. The action to take this castle, the capture of Ormuz, was undertaken by a joint Anglo-Persian alliance. Except there's a really important thing here. England and Portugal were allies. So it wasn't the English or the Royal Navy at this point taking part. It wasn't a crown-sanctioned force taking part. It was ships wholly owned and operated by a private company who happened to be based in London attacking a sovereign state's castle. Well, a sovereign state's castle owned by a sovereign state's company. You think that we're in weird situations now? <laughs> like, woo, this is like two McDonald's branches fighting each other, one in Russia and one in Ukraine. It's, it, we're getting into levels of weird here. The force consisted of five warships and four small pinnaces. The attack on the castle was not merely a random event though, however it was a well-timed and calculated move. The Persians had recently engaged in hostilities against the Portuguese and their army was besieging a Portuguese fort approximately 24 kilometers away in Kishim. But knowing it's his forces own weaknesses, Shah Abbas approached the English and asked for naval assistance in return for promises that future trading in silk would be in the English favor, further increasing the monopoly. The company, as previously stated, had known for a while that the dislodging of the Portuguese from Persia would be a tremendous victory, and without hesitation, an agreement was signed, providing for the sharing of any spoils and customs dues that they would seize after the taking of Ormuz. Along with this, the agreement contained provisions for the reparation of prisoners according to creed, and lastly, Persia would pay for half of the cost of supplying the fleet. Now in agreement, the company's ships first sailed to the beleaguered Portuguese, currently under siege in Kashim, and unleashed a heavy bombardment, quickly forcing the defenders to seek terms. With Kashim now firmly under Persian control, the fleet sailed onto its intended target of Ormuz, disembarking their complement of Persian soldiers. The English ships went on to engage the Portuguese flotilla guarding Ormuz, while the Persians landed forces and took the castle itself. None of this had royal assent, by the way. This is the company acting as the company. The siege was concluded by late April 1622, and the Portuguese were forced to retreat further to Mascat, but their position in the Far East was effectively gone now. Their hegemony had been broken, and Portugal really could not come back from this. And although economically speaking, this was a tremendous victory, it must be noted that King James I, the king that the company was supposed to be listening to, did not give his blessing to attack the Portuguese. England and Portugal had signed an alliance in 1386, which was still in effect and is still in effect today. And it is the oldest standing alliance in all of human history. And the king was furious that an alliance of over 100 years was now at risk. The Duke of Buckingham himself threatened to sue the company. But in a shocking turn of events, the monarch's mood changed when he received 10% of the profits from the capture. Upon receiving what had effectively amounted to a truckload of money, the king quickly retorted with, Did I deliver you from the complaint of the Spaniards, and do you return me nothing? The king moods again changed in a highly surprising way when another truckload of money came through the door. That was the same as the first. See what I mean about plausible deniability? The, the company was very helpful here. 
The company was able to, with this capture, trade unhindered with the Persians, albeit with some difficulty, akin to the Portuguese, the English would soon discover just how stubborn the Persians were, and trade, while unhindered, would prove to be somewhat difficult as they were not a people that could be pushed around too easily. But the fact still remained that although profits were not at all reaching the levels the company intended or wished, they were the only power able to trade at sea with the Persians. One other implication of this event was just how willing the English government was to begin to turn a blind eye to the model equivalent of Amazon seizing control of a castle and then bribing the President of the United States. Now that the company dominated trade from Persia and really circumnavigated the Ottoman Empire, it was completely free to focus its attention on India. The company would continue to expand, with the Portuguese ceding their base in Bombay as part of the dowry, which is now Mumbai, when the Princess Catherine of Braganza married King Charles II. The East India Company would again disregard the alliance with Portugal, and allied with the Dutch, the United East India Company, or VOC, attacked Portuguese and Spanish ships near China leading to the company establishing trading ports along the Chinese coast, furthering its dominance of the spice trade. In 1634, the Mughal Emperor gave his hospitality to the company via King James I and welcomed traders into his empire. His letter read as follows, Upon which assurance of your royal love, I have given my general command to all of the kingdoms and ports of my dominions to receive all merchants of the English nation as subjects of my friend. Sure, that'll last. The company seized on this permission and by 1647 had 23 factories with the major factories being protected within the forts of Fort William in Bengal, Fort St. George in Madras and Bombay Castle. In 1717, the emperor completely waived custom fees for company trade, which at the time mostly consisted of cotton, silk, indigo dye, saltpetre and of course, tea. Never forget the tea. In an act aimed at strengthening the English presence in the East, King Charles II granted the company in 1670 the rights to autonomous territorial acquisitions, to mint money, to command fortresses, and to raise its own military, and make war and peace in its acquired territories. In 1689, a Mughal fleet commanded by Sidi Yaqub attacked this company in Bombay. The company forces were forced to surrender after being besieged for a year, the besieged forces sent envoys to plead for pardon, although successful, the EIC was forced to pay a large indemnity and promised the Mughals that they would behave a bit better in future transactions. The emperor withdrew his troops and the company was able to re-establish themselves in Bombay and they were able to also set up a base in Calcutta. It really must be said the company was so profit driven. It, it was very, very brutal in its attempt to just get profit. The greatest competitors of the East India Company at the time were the Dutch VOC, or the Dutch East India Company. The Dutch held control over the land that today constitutes Indonesia. And now that the Portuguese had been ousted, the VOC was able to perform a trade monopoly centred around the Straits of Malacca. The aggressive Dutch expansion matched the equally aggressive East India Company expansion, and it should be noted that in 1707, the Act of Union was passed, merging England, Wales, Scotland and Ireland into the United Kingdom. The name would change a little bit over time, obviously, as Ireland would get better status and such, but effectively we now have the United Kingdom. So therefore, now on out, I'm going to refer to it as the United Kingdom British Empire, and it will be known as the British East India Company. You're not getting out of it that easily, Scotland, you were here too. The first two decades of the 17th century would see the VOC, the Dutch, rise to become the wealthiest commercial operation in the world with over 50,000 employees and 200 privately owned ships. And it would grow to dominate the spice trade. Like, I don't think I can put it into accurate words just how rich the Dutch East India Company was at this time, but I digress. The East India Company though, the British one, would find itself in such a fierce competition with the VOC and to a lesser extent the French during this time. And the trade war between the British and the Dutch continued throughout the 17th and 18th centuries. The catalyst to this increasingly violent competition was due to the fact that the highly lucrative spices of nutmeg, ginger, cloves, cinnamon, and pepper could only be found on the famed Spice Islands, now known as the Malaccas. Although beginning a trade rivalry between the two companies, this trade war would actually spiral to result into four actual wars between the United Kingdom and the Dutch Republic of which both sides would claim victory back and forth until the final war in the 1780s, yet the 1780s coincided directly with the American Revolution, and therefore British attention moved away from wars over trade and to the retention of their rebellious colonies. 
Now remember how I said that the company relied on a very complex system of effectively puppet princes and princedoms? This started to fall apart when the Mughal Empire began to collapse. It had controlled the subcontinent for hundreds of years, but by the mid 1700s it was falling apart and being surpassed by the Maratha Confederacy. It was during this monumental power shift that the company made its move. The company at first employed a few hundred soldiers as guards for their spice factories and on board their ships, but it soon became clear that they would require a bit more of a permanent military presence in order to take the trading mantle from the Dutch. By 1750, the company had 3,000 men at arms. By 1763, there were 26,000. By 1778, the company would call on a force of 67,000 men with hundreds of ships. By comparison, this military force of what was just still a trading company was larger than that of most nations around the world. With the Mughal Empire fragmenting, the EIC ruling the waves, her ships sailing up and down the coast and her armies conquering thousands of kilometers of territory, and of course her governmental practices bribing her way into thousands of kilometers of territory as well. In a few short decades, the company grew to rule all of modern day Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, and Burma. The East India Company's ground forces are a complete mess when it comes to culture, when it comes to culture clashes, and really its whole structure is very, very in-depth and interesting. So is its naval structure. Its naval structure is very odd, and the true power of the company, although the army was necessary to control the spice trade, the navy was where it truly shone with getting the spices to Europe. And that's where we run into the sort of hard point, because when you start to get to the point of the company dominating the subcontinent and Far East in 1778, well, just around the corner is a little guy called Napoleon, and he had some issues to settle with the British, to put it mildly. The company would control hundreds upon hundreds of ships during its lifespan, and some were actual warships, Genuinely, they had frigates and stuff, but the majority of ships were of a specific design called an East Indiaman. As the name suggests, these ships were designed to sail east to the Indies. The ships, in the case of the EIC, would sail from England around the Cape of Good Hope, hope not to sink because it was freaking horrible to sail down there, and on to India, with many ships continuing their voyages to China before returning home via the Cape of Good Hope and St. Helena. After 1815, they could wave to Napoleon as they went by. These were not merely trading ships though, however, with some of them being more heavily armed than contemporary warships, the ships were so large that from a distance they could be mistaken for ships of the line. Whilst not as heavily armed as ships of the line, the vessels would often carry an incredibly heavy armament. Enter the Bombay Castle, built in 1792 and carrying 34 guns and a crew of 135 men. It was hard to argue that this merchant ship was hapless and at the mercy of raiders and privateers. The ability of East Indiamen to defend themselves would be put to the test over and over throughout this time period, but the best example, yet as with many events that I've written about before, is relatively unknown and it's overlooked because of things that happened on either side of it, and that's at Pulo Ora on the 14th of February, 1804. Britain is the only country that remained at war with Napoleon for effectively the entire Napoleonic Wars. In many ways, it was the ultimate thorn in the Emperor's side. And its very existence and keeping it going at war and also keeping the continent going by making more coalitions. Because, I mean, the Napoleonic Wars could be summed up in the sense of, you lost to Napoleon, huh? You want some money to do it again? Britain bankrolled basically the entire continent to fight Napoleon for most of the period. And a lot of it comes down to these convoys, to the East Indiamen and the East India Company's wealth that is pouring into London from the Far East. With that said... Napoleon placed a lot of his policy after he realised there was not really a possibility of beating Britain at sea around the continental system. The idea being that they could cut the lifeline that was trade and force the British Empire into a surrender or a peace deal, or at least to get it out of the way so Napoleon could dominate Europe. Such was the goal of Bonaparte's naval strategy. The French Emperor's dreams of breaking the British hegemony at sea, though, would be shattered by the victories of Lord Admiral Nelson at the battles of Copenhagen, Abakir Bay, also known as the Nile, and the legendary Battle of Trafalgar. Also, there were multiple others. I mean, for example, the Dutch fleet was destroyed at Camperdown by Admiral Duncan. There were multiple times where French fleets and Spanish fleets were captured or stopped at sea. St. Vincent was a huge loss to the Spanish. There are multiple instances of this, but effectively, France was no longer able to fight the British directly at sea. The mere presence of so many French and later Spanish ships in Europe, though, meant that the Royal Navy was struggling in a sense to have a sufficient amount of warships based around the Empire's holdings in India, particularly frigates. Frigates are the ideal warship for protecting trade in this area, and they were needed to scout for the fleets. Nelson famously said, 
that if he would have died, his last words would have been that he wanted more frigates just before the Nile. He only had three frigates to scour to try and find the French fleet at multiple times during his command in the Mediterranean. Frigates were vital and there was a shortage of them. This was where the immense power and the size of the East India Company truly came into its own. Each Indiaman was armed roughly with 38 heavy guns, but many captains would often paint false gun ports on their ships, thus giving them the appearance of the ship of the line at a distance. Normally, the crews were only meant to ward off attacks by lone pirates or raiders, not warships. The crews of the Indiaman were often not well trained and the guns of a lower quality. While disguising their ships had worked in the past, for example, during the Bali Strait incident on the 28th of January 1797, French raiding squadrons would not be fooled forever and in an effort to ensure that no ship and its valuable cargo would be isolated and taken, the company had its ships gather in ports before setting out together in larger convoys. The idea was that by combining their firepower, they would effectively be able to ward off and overwhelm any French squadron that they could feasibly be operating in the area. This idea was proven effective in February 1799 near Macau, where a convoy of Indiamen were able to drive off a combined Franco-Spanish squadron before the Royal Navy escort was able to engage the enemy force. Then, first consul, but soon to be Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte, ordered in March 1803, this is before Trafalgar, a squadron of French warships to sail east to disrupt the British trade network. The squadron was commanded by Contra Admiral Charles Alexander de Land Linois and consisted of the 74 gun ship of the line Marengo and three accompanying frigates. This is a very powerful force, it cannot be understated. Compared to an Indiaman, these could wipe the floor with it. Lenoir based his squadron on the island of Ile de France, east of Madagascar, and in preparation for hostilities to begin, when the Napoleonic Wars effectively began on the 16th of May, or re-began, because there was a short peace, Lenoir was in port, and immediately set about landing troops and supplies on the French island of Reunion, and at the Dutch port of Batavia. Lenoir would then dispatch one of his frigates, the Atalante, towards Muscat and the Gulf of Amman. The voyage of the Atlante would be successful as she managed to capture numerous individual ships and was even able to burn the trading port of Ben Coulin. Lenoir anchored in Batavia for the winter, where he received a report detailing the exact composition and date of departure of a tremendous convoy known as the British China Fleet. The convoy system is not an advent of the First or Second World Wars, it truly began during this period of time, and much earlier as well. The Spanish, in fact, were using convoys known as the Flota to bring gold from the New World back to Europe for many, many years. Lenoir set sail on the 28th of December with the Marengo, the frigates Belle Poule, beautiful ship, the Belle Poule is gorgeous, and Samiante. The corvette Berceau, and lastly the Dutch brig Aventura, sailed in accompaniment. Lenoir had his ships stocked with enough supplies for six months as he expected an extended patrol in the South China Sea and the Strait of Malacca. The China fleet, in question, was an annual merchant convoy that would gather in the Pearl River and Canton during the winter, before first sailing to India, where further ships would join the convoy, before the convoy would together leave as one for Britain. The China fleet of 1804 departed Canton in late January, and by the time it passed the Straits of Malacca, it contained 16 of the largest East Indiamen and 11 smaller ships, known as country ships. Joining the convoy was a Portuguese merchantman, and interestingly, a ship from Botany Bay in New South Wales also known now as Australia. The East India Company, it must be said, did provide an escort for this fleet, but it was by no means up to the task of defending the convoy. The escort was merely a small armed brig called the Ganges. In defence of the company, the news that the war had broken out between the British and French empires had failed to reach Canton prior to the fleet's sailing. Had the news reached the fleet, their sailing would likely have been delayed and an escort would have been provided by the India squadron. Lenoir knew how valuable this convoy was. In modern currency, its cargo was well worth roughly 700 million pounds. Yeah, that's a lot. And although his spies had incorrectly reported the fleet was guarded by a detachment of warships, he was confident his very powerful squadron would be able to seize, if not the whole convoy, a significant portion of it. The company was understandably quite nervous at the prospect of their convoy sailing unescorted whilst a state of war existed. So they consulted various captains, including Henry Meryton, who, while commanding the East Indiaman Exeter on the 4th of August 1800, captured a French frigate off the coast of Brazil. Yet, yeah, this madman commanding a merchant ship captured a frigate. Meriton advised that the convoy, from a distance, appeared powerful enough to ward off an attack by a squadron of frigates or smaller ships of the line, both in its appearance, remembering that they used to paint themselves to look like uh, ships of the line, and also from the fact that each ship carried a sizable gun battery. 
On the contrary, Captain Alfred John Farquharson argued against Meriton that the convoy's crews were so poorly trained that they would be unable to work together to dissuade an attack, and that the ships would be picked apart one by one, not unlike what Nelson did at the Nile. The company decided that the convoy could not be delayed any further, and after naming their most experienced Captain Commodore Nathaniel Dance, the officer in charge aboard the now flagship El Camden, they were ordered to sail at the nearest opportunity. Keep in mind that the money from this convoy was vital to the British war effort. At approximately 8 in the morning on the 14th of February 1804, the convoy was beginning to transit the Straits of Malacca with the island of Pula Ora in sight to the southwest. The Royal George raised the signal that three sets of sail were approaching from the direction of the island. Lenoir had succeeded in his goal of intercepting the convoy and had placed himself at this crucial choke point, betting that his best chance was finding and successfully attacking the convoy while it transited the Straits. Commodore Dance was not exactly sure what kind of ships the Royal George had spotted, and he ordered the Alfred, Royal George, Bombay Castle, Hope, and the Brig Ganges to make an approach and investigate. This small squadron rapidly discovered that the ships spotted belonged to more than three ships, and crucially, they were in fact warships, and quite the threat. By one in the afternoon, Dance had ready the convoy's guns and reformed his ships in the fashion that the largest Indiemen formed a line of battle. This manoeuvre was undertaken in the hope that formation would trick the French warships into believing that the squadron were not merchantmen and were warships of the line of themselves. Failing that, the line of battle would assist the convoy with defence if they had no other option to fight. Each of Lenoir's ships were faster than all of the convoy ships, with the only exception being the Ganges. Lenoir ordered his ships to fall in line behind the convoy, using their advantage in speed. The French were able to take up such a position that they would be able to decide when, where and how they attacked, and try as they might, the slower British merchants would not be able to break away save for a miracle. Noting that night was falling, and his advantage in firepower could be negated if he initiated combat, the French Admiral decided to shadow the convoy overnight and attack the following morning. Albeit a brief reprieve, it was clear to Commodore Dance that his ships would now have to fight and that there would be no chance for his ships to slip away, and so using the Ganges as a shuttle, he began to redistribute some of the crews from the smaller ships amongst the Indiamen, while sheltering them behind the larger ships, the idea being that if boarded, more crew on board would give them a better fighting chance. Lenoir would greatly be criticised later, particularly by his own side, for giving the convoy this much vital time to make their preparations, and his defence would be his need for caution. If the bold front put on by the enemy in the daytime had been intended as a ruse to conceal his weakness, he would have profited by the darkness of the night to endeavour to conceal his escape, and in that case he should have taken advantage of his manoeuvres, but I soon became convinced that this security was not feigned. Three heavy ships constantly kept their lights up, and the fleet continued to lie too in order of battle throughout the night. This position facilitated my gaining of the wind, and enabled me to observe the enemy more closely. That's Lenoir being quoted and translated by William James, a naval historian writing in 1827. Lenoir's excuse was basically I needed to watch them and keep an eye on them, which he did, and he somehow didn't notice at all that they were merchants, but we ignore that. As dawn broke on the 15th of February, both squadrons raised their colours. Dance, still hoping to convince Lenoir that some of his ships were warships, ordered the Ganges and four other ships to raise the Blue Ensign, whilst the rest of the convoy raised the Red Ensign. The regulations regarding the usage of flags on British ships at the time implied that the ships flying the blue were warships of Admiral Rainier's squadron and protecting the merchants flying the red. This ruse worked as Lenoir's intelligence reports, as I said, wrongly informed him that the merchants were guarded by warships. Lenoir only knew about the original 23 ships in the convoy that left China, not the fact that six more had joined on the journey to Pulo Ora. Lenoir assumed these extra ships were the warships, spurred on by the fact that some of the ships in Canton were repainted as ships of the line before they left port. Crucially, in some cases, after the French spies had given their report, it's highly possible that this was the reason Lenoir did not attack a night when the ships first sighted one each other all the night before. At 9 o'clock in the morning, the French ships were still standing off and observing. There was a reluctance to attack, and according to Lenoir, this was to gauge the nature of his enemy's performance. At this point, Dance reformed his ships into a sailing formation to try and get his convoy into the Straits before the French. This move, however, backfired as Lenoir now saw the convoy as less of an intimidating threat, and thus he moved to attack. At 1pm it was clear the faster ships under Lenoir were in danger of cutting the convoy in two and isolating the rear. Dance saw this and ordered his lead ships to attack and cut in front of the French line. Fifteen minutes later, the French opened fire on the Royal George, who at the time was leading the British charge. The next four ships in line, the Ganges, Earl Camden, the flagship, Worley, and Alfred returned fire. Unfortunately, the Ganges at first fired upon the Royal George in error. Apparently, their disguise was so good that their own escort couldn't realise who they were. But they quickly corrected this, 
The captain of the next ship in line, Hope, eager to engage, rammed the Wally, forcing both ships to retire and untangle their rigging. The ships leading the charge exchanged fire with the superior French ships for approximately 40 minutes, with neither side inflicting a great amount of damage on the other, the only damage being superficial. At 2pm, Limoire abandoned the action and ordered full sail eastwards away from the convoy. Not wanting his ruse to be uncovered, Commodore Dance ordered the ships flying the Blue Ensign to chase, leading them after the French squadron in Earl Camden. Even though none of the ships under his command could hope to catch the French, or, you know, win in a one-on-one -on -one duel, they still spurned on anyway, the hope being that the show of force would convince the French to not return. The chase would last two hours, with Hope coming the closest to Aventura, but unable to overhaul the brig. At 4pm, Dance realised that his ships giving chase were in danger. If the French turned their ships around and were doubled back, there was little hope that his ships could fight and win an engagement. After all, they only looked like warships. They neither had the gun complement or the crew to stand much chance, so he ordered them to rejoin the fleet. Four hours later, with darkness gathering, the convoy entered the straits and dropped anchor. On the 28th of February, the ship of the line HMS Scepter and HMS Albion joined the convoy as a proper escort and protected them until St. Helena in the South Atlantic Ocean where they were relieved by HMS Plantagenet, who remained with the convoy until it reached Britain. The convoy would, after Pula Aura, not encounter any further incident on its homeward journey, probably linked to the fact that Nelson was chasing the French fleet around, and would deliver its cargo unmolested. Meanwhile, Lenoir returned to Batavia after the action, arriving after an uneventful several days, where he was delighted to discover the Atlante. After resupplying and detaching the Aventura, Lenoir sailed for his base on the Ile de France, where he would arrive on the 2nd of April. Lenoir would receive much criticism for his action during the battle, both during and after, in an attempt to explain himself, he would afterwards say the following, The ships which had tacked and rejoined those which were engaging us, and three of the engaging ships manoeuvred to double our rear, while the remainder of the fleet, crowding a sail and bearing up, evinced an intention to surround us. By this manoeuvre, the enemy would have rendered my situation very dangerous. The superiority of his force was ascertained, and I had no longer to deliberate on the part should I take to avoid the consequence of an unequal engagement profiteering by the smoke. I hauled up to port, and steering east-northeast, I increased by distance from the enemy, whose continued pursuit of the squadron for three hours, discharging at it several broadsides. Basically, they surrounded us, they came at us really hard, and then they kept chasing us, and they wouldn't leave us alone. The Battle of Pulo Ora, it must be remembered, was a naval engagement between a trading company and a sovereign power. The French Empire versus a company, and the company had emerged victorious. Again, it is the model equivalent of a cargo ship owned by Amazon getting some harpoons, shooting at and making a foreign warship run away. The power and prestige held by the company at this point is almost unfathomable. The company's navy controlled the Far East, able to fight back and beat nations that wished to raid the cargo, while the army ruled the entire Indian subcontinent. What started with a gathering of London merchants intent on opening English trade to the Far East was now more powerful than most countries save for major powers. In 1805, it can be argued that the United States of America was less powerful and less economically prosperous than the East India Company. It's a spicy argument to make, but it is one that I would also make. The company now seemed unstoppable, a power in its own right, commanding a military able to defend its own borders, <laughs> its borders, the company's borders. But history is a fickle thing and barely 50 years after the Battle of Pulo Ora, the writing appeared to be on the wall for the company. The cataclysmic fall of the company, which had taken hundreds of years to build from nothing, came about due to the Indian Rebellion of 1857, also known as the Indian Mutiny. The mutiny had resulted from decades of mismanagement by the company of the Indian peoples, and the spark ultimately being the introduction of new rifles, which required the user to bite the packaging of the charge used to load the weapon. Rumours spread that the packaging was coated in beef or pork fat, which for the locally recruited and trained Hindu and Muslim soldiers was extremely sacrilegious, and in short order, a rebellion rose up. The sheer scale of death and devastation in India resulted in the condemnation of the company, who according to Parliament and the British people were entirely to blame, and they absolutely were. The way that the company managed the local populations was incredibly ineffective, as I've said a couple times in this video. It was profit, profit, profit. That's all that mattered was profit. In 1848, the nail was put in the coffin when Parliament passed the India Act of 1858, and it effectively placed all land in modern-day Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, and Burma under Crown authority. 
The company's military was either disbanded or absorbed into the Empire's regular armies, with the subcontinent becoming what would be known as the British Raj. The great monopoly on trade that the company relied upon to sustain its existence was now broken. The company would continue to exist in a reduced form, managing the trade of tea and the small island base of St Helena under the eye of the British government until Parliament passed the East India Stock Dividend Redemption Act in 1873. The act, which came into effect on the 1st of January 1874, formally dissolved the company. In its 274 years of operations, the British East India Company had made the empire wealthier and had assisted in the extending reach of its power further than any other power in human history. This mere trading company had fought and defeated the old empires of Europe. It had brutally controlled an entire subcontinent, and it had stood toe-to-toe -to -toe on the world stage, effectively as a major power in its own right. The company's record will likely stand undefeated, and its subsequent influence on modern-day history is truly unfathomable. For example, the countries that made up the British Raj, their borders, were largely set in place due to the extent of company conquests in the region, the money that the company earned would allow the British Empire to afford the extreme cost of the Napoleonic Wars, and it would emerge the court rulers of a quarter of the Earth's land mass and ocean. Britannia may have ruled the waves, but it cost a lot of money. And this money was largely accumulated by the operations of what was known as the Right Honourable East India Trading Company. In its wake, the company would leave a history of heavy brutality and so much so to the point that, well, the British Crown and the British people said enough was enough. This is the longest video I've ever made, like the longest. And uh, yeah, if you uh, enjoyed it, let me know. That was very long. I didn't get into the horrors too much because, well, it would get banned off YouTube. Um, but you know, if you enjoyed, like, comment, subscribe, 